Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of Yazoo City. For all the choices you have to make today, I am honored that you have chosen to worship with us in the comfort of your home. As you sit back, would you also participate in the service and allow the Lord to transform your life? For that's why we are here today. Thank you again for joining us. May God bless you today.
our prayer of the Holy Spirit to come down in this place today. Holy Spirit. First Baptist, if you're visiting with us this morning, you'll notice there's a flap just inside of your bulletin. And as your gift to us, if you would fill that out and place it in the offering plate, we would uh, greatly appreciate that. I want to give you a, a quick update. Most of you know that uh, our youth got back from Dallas yesterday, uh, on Mission Dallas. We work with a church called Cornerstone Baptist Church, who have been working in South Dallas for around 20 or 30 years. Um, one pastor there for right around 30 years named uh, Pastor Chris, and, and so what our students were doing there were just uh, working alongside those churches' missions with the homeless in the food shelter, the clothing shelter, they have a shower ministry, and then also they are going in and just revitalizing the community. So many homes that are dilapidated, uh, people on fixed income who can't afford to get their homes back up to city standards, and they're being kicked out of their homes and made homeless, and so uh, one of the, the missions of that church is to go in and rebuild those homes or fix those homes, bring them up to the standards so those people don't become homeless and then also they help find them jobs and get them uh, as productive parts of the of the community uh, and then in addition to that several of our students also worked with a back in a backyard Bible club in a largely Hispanic community where um, the church had not been involved completely and I think that group of students really really enjoyed that I think our students who were uh, painting also enjoyed that uh, we took 32 with us and, and if I can just if you went on the trip as a chaperone or a, or a student if you would just stand for just a moment and, and they're all over the place, some downstairs, some upstairs. Our chaperones were troopers. Y'all can sit down now. <laughs> Our chaperones were troopers, uh, and I think that Mr. Benton and Walker fed us better than we might have eaten at home. No offense to any mothers. I've never had fried chicken on a, on a mission trip, and it was unbelievable. Uh, but um, I was really proud of our students and our, and our adults who worked. Uh, it took us a little while to get in the groove of things uh, at the beginning of the week, but right near the end of the week, they learned what it meant not just to serve, but to serve in the name of the Lord, uh, doing everything for the glory of God. And, and I think that that drove them right there at the end of the week as they began to really, that, as that began to really click with them. So I'd ask you that you would continue to pray for them, that as the things they learned there would translate uh, home, and that as, as those types of missions continue, they would, they would know how that goes. As we, as we begin to close this, let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you give us the resources and the opportunities to serve those uh, less fortunate than us outside of our community. But God, I pray that we would let that drive us to serve those here in our community. And even today, as we gather here to worship your name as one church, uh, there are those outside of our church who need to hear your name. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be driven uh, to even today leave this building and, and to tell others about you. This morning, I pray that you're lifted up and glorified. I pray this in your name. Amen.
a mother barely twenty out there on her own a teenage boy in prison before he's even grown the illness of a loved one and a widow no one calls there is one solution one answer for it all there is power in the name of jesus there is hope there is strength and victory to claim there's healing in sense of awe and wonder at the very name of Jesus. That's why we have so many songs that we sing about the name of Jesus. No matter what you're going through today, what's going on in your life, the name of Jesus can take care of you. Let's just sing this while we're singing. Jesus, 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 there's just something
Jesus. Indeed, there is no other name under heaven or earth by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus. And it's in his name that we come together and ask you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. As we humble ourselves now to respond to his word, as we continue in our worship, we have been looking at this idea of why churches die. And we've looked at several diseases that we face physically that also get in our spiritual life. We've looked at a hard heart. We, we've looked at atrophy where our muscles deteriorate for lack of use. We've looked at a swollen tongue. We have looked at several other diseases. And today I want us to look at OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And many of you may have that. Uh, it's kind of, you know, me talking about gluttony, I feel about the same way talking about OCD. I like for stuff to line up, for stuff to match, for stuff to be in order. But when that begins to infiltrate our spiritual life, not only does it hurt us, but oftentimes we see it hurts others and can cause churches to die. In Mark chapter 10, in verse 35, we see a request from James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Don't you know 
what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink from and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As I started my, my previous pastorate, I was excited to go back into an association that I had grown up in, attending church camp in this association and, and doing a lot of, of youth activities with. Very similar to the association that we have. As you know, Baptist churches are part of, of associations that are local. And uh, I was excited about getting back into this where I knew people and I knew the, many of the ministries that had happened inside this association. But I was in for a surprise when I went to the first meeting. Where there was a man that I had known since a, a young boy. His dad actually had married my parents. Uh, his brother had two daughters that me and my brother grew up with, uh, went to school, went to church with. And I knew this guy had, had taken some leadership positions in the association, did some things, but I didn't know he had taken every leadership position in the association. Anytime that anyone asked for, for any assistance, he was the first one to volunteer. And you would think, well, that's great. Well, what had happened was that he thought nobody could do it better than he could do it himself. And so every time that there was a need, any time someone was needed to lead an effort, he led that effort. And as a result, had trampled many people along the path. Many churches had dropped out of the association. The ministries that I saw as a teenager were no longer vibrant, were not even making an impact in the kingdom. And many people were hurt by this man's actions. He suffered from spiritual OCD. This disease sets in when we think we are the only ones that can do something and do it right. It's that old saying, if it's going to get done, I guess I've got to do it. Or if I don't do it, it never gets done right. These individuals do not necessarily want the spotlight. I mean, they're willing to work behind the scenes. But they will trample anyone that gets in their way behind the scenes. And they want control behind the scenes. These individuals often resent those who will not serve with them. And even we can begin to think of ourselves as holier than, than others because look at what we are doing. But then we find out the reason people won't serve is because they can't serve. That those with the position do not allow them the opportunity to do so. It often attacks various ministries in the church that have been going on for a long time. If you have someone who's been involved in a ministry and for many years, they oftentimes develop a little clique or a group that's there and they won't allow others to come in. And if there's any other suggestions and that's just the craziest idea that's ever out there and they feel threatened by anyone that wants to have buy-in into that ministry. And that causes this disease, as you can see, could cause problems in the church. It has happened here. I won't point out the ministries, but it's very susceptible in many, many times in children and youth ministries. For you have parents that want their children to have a great experience in each of those ministries. And so they start when the child is young, and they volunteer, and they get plugged in. Then they serve on the leadership team of that ministry. Many times they may actually lead that ministry in the absence of a staff member. And as their child grows, they get more and more authority, they think, and a greater position. And if anybody else wants to come in when their baby gets in that ministry, uh-uh, it's not going to happen. The only way you can ever get in is when that person moves on to the next one. It happens many times in, when new members are at it. They have a hard time plugging in. It happens on church staffs when a new staff member is added in and may begin offering some new suggestions and long-time staff members have a hard time with that. It happens when a pastor comes on. It's happened here among our deacons. About two years ago, over two years ago, our deacons realized, as I shared with them, that 
We had an unhealthy, unbiblical model. They were not to be a board that every decision ran by them. But instead, they were to be servants, which is the word deacon is derived from. And so they made the decision, presented that to you all. So we changed the governing documents of our church, and our deacons would become servants. But some of those still want to meet every month and go over financial reports and have everything ran before them, which is a reminder. Next week is our deacon election. You need to be praying about that this week. And do not believe just because you elect a man to position that he will start serving. If he's not already serving, he's not going to serve with the position. And so you see how this disease can creep in within our church, within our personal lives, and the damage I hope you see that it can bring. But this is not a new problem. We've seen in this passage, James and John asked Jesus for the seats of honor and the seats of power in his kingdom. These guys still don't get it. I mean, Jesus has been talking to them over and over about serving and about how their life was not about them, but it was about others. He is trying to transform these men, and they didn't get it. That as Jesus' life is nearing the end, they gather and pull Jesus off to the side. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, before we jump on them too hard, how often do we do the same thing? Lord, I want this. That if we could have a one-on-one or a two-on-one meeting with Jesus, it would be, hey, uh, Lord, I want you to do what I want you to do. And Jesus teaches them that the ambition to be on top and to beat down others is not to be in the life of a child of God. Instead, we have been called to serve. And this flies in the face of human nature. And we have talked about this, this aspect of serving many times throughout the course of our time together. And the importance that it has in our church is a priority that we have. Worship, worship, serve, share, grow. Those priorities that we established as a church that we seek to fulfill. But yet so often again, this obsessive compulsiveness can set in. And we think that nobody else can do it the way that I can do it. And so we separate ourselves from them, and we keep many people from serving and only give them the opportunity to serve. So how can we guard against that today? What's the medicine we can take for this? Well, first of all, begin with checking your motives. James and John, we know, were part of the inner circle. They shared an access with Jesus unlike any other. Only Peter had the similar access. They got to be with him at times that no one else was. They would both become leaders in the early church. James was the first of the apostles to be killed for his faith. We know that John was the only one not martyred, but was sent off to to Patmos as part of his persecution. And we see great growth in the life of these men and all the other disciples after the resurrection. But here we see James and John's real personalities come out. Remember, these two boys, these brothers, were called sons of thunder. That was their personality. These were the kids that you didn't like in the neighborhood. I mean, you don't get the title sons of thunders by hanging out with mama in the kitchen. All right? These were the kids that threw rocks down the street. These were the kids that threw stuff at your mailbox. These were the kids that terrorized your cat. Okay? These were the ones that later on we see their personality come out. They go to Samaria. Samaria doesn't accept them. And they ask Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Do you want us to destroy these people for their way that they have dealt with us? The sons of thunder. They never probably thought their lives would turn out the way that it has. They were supposed to carry on the family fishing business to become successful in the eyes of the world. And they have done that until Jesus called them and they changed their life. But they still don't understand it all. Matthew's account of this has their mother coming along with them. Now, and, and Matthew has it. She asked the question. Mark doesn't have the mother anywhere in there. How do we reconcile those two accounts? I believe that the mother was there. She was most likely Jesus' aunt, which makes James and John his cousins. And they probably thought that the best way that they could get the best seats was to have Mama come and pull the family strings. I mean, she knew Jesus from the start. She, had, she probably could come tell stories about changing his diaper and, and his first steps and all that kind of stuff. And so we thought, let's get Mama in there. I believe James and John are there. 
And that the mother asked the question, yet the mother is asking on behalf of, of James and John. So Mark attributes it to James and John are the one asking, because essentially they were. I believe they put their mom up to it. Hey, mom, why don't you go ask Jesus? There's a greater chance he will give you what you want than he'll give us what we want. And before we get too tough on these guys, I mean, Jesus did say in Matthew 19, verse 28, that when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he told them they would sit on thrones, and so they're thinking, I want the one on your right and your left. But they missed his words in Mark chapter 10, verse 31, but many who are first will be last in the last first. Jesus spoke about a cross. They wanted a crown. Jesus spoke about humility. They wanted power. And they had it all wrong. And they never stopped to check their motives. It's easy for us to get our motives out of whack. James and John were interested in glory and position and rank. They wanted to be closest to Jesus and to be higher than anyone else. They wanted their will done in their way. And oftentimes that creeps into our lives. My way or the highway, so to speak. And then that creeps into our the way that we serve within our churches and other people. Then people can't even begin to work with us because we have that mentality. It's time for us to stop and to check our motives. Why do we do what we do? In 1981, President Reagan was shot by John Hinckley. Many of you may remember that. Washington was shocked, stunned. Vice President George Bush was nowhere near. He was immediately unavailable. And the White House didn't know what was going on. History tells us that chaos reigned in the White House. And that's when the Secretary of State, General Alexander Haig, stepped in. He went to a press conference, and the first words he spoke were, I'm in charge here. He was never able to live those words down. What he thought he was doing was providing crisis or leadership in a crisis. What the country saw was a man who was hungry for power. I'm in charge here. You know, she looked at all the words Jesus spoke, and you will never find those four words together. For times when Jesus very well could have said, guys, I'm in charge here, he never uttered those words. And we should not either. We need to get our reason for serving straightened out. It is the Lord that we serve. We don't do it to impress anyone else. We don't do it to try to gain the favor of God. For Paul told the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, that he, speaking of the Lord, will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So would you answer the question this morning, why do you do what you do? In areas in which you serve, in areas where you lead through serving, why do you do what you do? Do you do it for recognition? Do you do it for honor? Do you do it for the pat on the back? Listen, if that's your motive, you won't serve very long because those things will die out. We need to question our motives today. Why are we here? So many times we think we can come to a worship service so we can manipulate God. You may not think of it that terms, but you know what? If I don't go to church, I just have a horrible week. So the flip side is I'm going to go to church because God will make my week good. Or we think that we can go to get something from the Lord. Listen, yes, there's times when we gather, and it should be every time that God speaks to us when we get something from, but our time together is to give God the praise that he deserves. And that is the reason that we gather, is to worship him and declare that he alone is Lord. Check your motives today. Why do we do what we do? In order to prevent spiritual obsessive compulsiveness, secondly, we need to expect difficulty. See, we have bought into the notion that when we follow Jesus, everything's going to be okay. That's what the world would tell us. That's what the prosperity gospel says. You follow the Lord, great things are going to happen to you. You give financially, you're going to have a financial windfall that's going to come your way. You live, do what the Lord wants you to do. You live according to his words. Life is going to be grand. And probably every one of us could testify that that's a lie. That walking with the Lord 
involves difficulty. See, James and John pictured themselves as the elite of the elite. They were going to rule over the other disciples and everyone else in an earthly empire. And so Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. You have no clue what you're asking me to do. And he goes on to ask if they can drink the drink and be baptized with the baptism with which he is baptized. The cup, the drinking of the drink, is a, a metaphor for suffering. Baptism is a metaphor for being plunged into calamity. Jesus is saying he's not going to be sprinkled with a little bit of suffering. He's going to be submerged in it. And he looks at them and asks if they are willing to share his fate. If they are willing to be doused with the waters of hardship and trial. And there's James and John. They answer with complete confidence. I think they answer too quick. They're a little too eager in verse 39. We can. We can do this. Sign us up. Because they want it glory. But Jesus tells them to get ready for grief. Because you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. While we don't always know in advance how much we're going to suffer, we do know that if we are serious about following Jesus and serving him wholeheartedly, we will suffer. We will face difficulty. James, he didn't suffer for long, but he was the first of the disciples to lose his life. John lived to be 95, and those 95 years were filled with difficulty. If you are serious about serving, get ready for trouble. And the phrase to drink the cup has reference not only to suffering, but also to remaining faithful to the end. For the phrase was meant that the cup would be emptied out. There would not be a drop left in the cup. So can you drink the cup that I drink, Jesus is saying. Not just the suffering, but the drink that everything in your life is poured out. That there is nothing left for you to give. Yes, we can. They didn't understand. Now, did they? Yeah, they drank the cup and they were baptized with the baptism for they suffered greatly. Now, listen to me. You can't beat kingdom service. I'm glad the Lord called me to pastor and to serve in the way he did. He's called you in various ways. You cannot beat seeing life change and kingdom impact. But listen to me. It's not easy. It's full of heartache. It's full of difficulty. It will cost you to serve Christ. Are you willing to pay the price? And many times we're like James and John. Yes, we can. Absolutely. But in reality, our actions show a little something different. Because when we have this obsessive compulsiveness in our spiritual life, when the difficulty comes, we often go the other way. It's been said there's four, times of, four types of football players. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some football. So we're going to talk about it today. There's four types of football players. There are those who get knocked down and do not get up. And those are the ones that you see get carted off the field and they get applause and that's it. You never hear from them again. There are those who get knocked down, but they get back up. The third type are those who get knocked down and they get back up so they can get knocked down again to get back up and get knocked down. And it's just a continual cycle. But the fourth are those who do the knocking down. And as a football player, that's the one you want to be. It's the one who does the knocking down. But in Christian service, there's not such a person. There is no one who knocks down. Instead, we get knocked down, but we get back up. And many times we get knocked down right back again, but we get back up. And they may, those knockdowns may be spread apart. But it's not an option for us to get knocked down and just lay there and not get up. We get knocked down and we get up. And we may get knocked down again, but we understand that that's the walk, that's what happens when you walk with the Lord. And so we get back up. And we stand firm as He teaches us, but we may get knocked down again, but we get back up. And the cycle continues in our life. And many times we sit back and go, Is it worth it? This hurts, it's painful, it's frustrating. Is it worth it? Well, Paul would tell the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, that your service is not in vain. Let that sink in in our lives. The heartache, it's not in vain. 
the pain, the frustration, the disappointment, when people let you down, it's not in vain. Let us continue to serve and to put the needs of others before our own and make kingdom impact. There's a third thing we have to do to prevent spiritual obsessive compulsiveness, and that's put others first. Did you notice what happens? James and John asked the question, and verse 41 tells us that the other ten became indignant with James and John. To put that in redneck terms, they were ticked off. Why? I don't think they were mad that James and John asked the question. I think they were mad. They were upset because they didn't ask it. They didn't get the chance. They were upset that James and John beat them to the punch. They wanted that position on the right and the left as well. They were not going to give up those top two spots without a fight. You know, it's easy to be somebody angry at someone else's sin and then rationalize our own. And that's where the other ten were. And then we're told in verse 42 that Jesus called them together. Now, Jesus knows their default systems are set on selfishness. And so I can see him going, all right, boys, everybody get here. It's time to have a man-to-man talk. And he begins to address what happened. He doesn't take the two brothers aside and blast them. He doesn't take the other ten away and slam them for being indignant. He simply gets a lesson on how things are run different in his kingdom. There's a sharp contrast between the servanthood philosophy of the Savior and the world system in which they lived. And he says in verse 42, You know that those who regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them. See, as the disciples as Jews couldn't stand the Gentiles. They couldn't stand the Romans. And the Romans ruled the Israelites, the Jews during this time. That's why they were looking for a Messiah who would have an earthly throne, an earthly empire to overthrow the Romans. And so they knew how the Roman authorities lorded over those that were under them. And Jesus looks at them, bringing that to their mind, and says in verse 43, Not so with you. And he begins to teach them that in the family of God, there are one category of people, servants. A a Christian who is not serving is a contradiction of terms. So Jesus tells them in verse 43, Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. This is a countercultural and a radical teaching for Jesus to de- define greatness in terms of servanthood because slaves were considered to be socially inferior. Even the few masters who believed the slaves were equals would not go as far as Jesus did when he inverted the role of servant and master. A servant is someone whose heart is set upon and whose will is bound to the will and the wishes of another. A servant is always doing what somebody else wants done. If I am your servant, then what you say goes. You had the last word. That's the path to greatness. The past couple of weeks, many of you have been enthralled or disgusted, whichever one, at the two conventions that have happened in our world. In our country, we had the Republican convention, then you had the Democratic convention. Some of you have been glued to every bit of that. Some of you are like me, you just knew it happened. But what I have found out, and it happens every year, that that numerous speeches were given about each party's nominee and how that party's nominee was the best one and how that party's nominee was going to change America. But I have seen nowhere where anyone admitted that in order to be great, you must give up your personal rights and serve others. And that's what Jesus is teaching. Greatness does not happen because somebody says you have great leadership abilities. Greatness does not come because you win an election. Greatness does not come because you were nominated for something. But greatness comes when we are willing to give up all of our rights and serve others. We need to be repeatedly reminded that our central ambition to be to minister to people, not to be admired by them. The disciples are not consigned to last place. They are shown how they can be first. They're not consigned to slavery status. They are shown how to become great. And it all happens through serving, through putting others first. 
Jesus labels the desire to dominate as pagan. If you're taking notes, that'd be a great sentence for you to write down. Jesus labels the desire to dominate as pagan. How often is that setting in our life? That OCD, we want to dominate, we're in charge. If it's going to happen, I've got to do it. If it's going to be done right, I've got to do it. And we elevate ourselves, and we show the lifestyle of somebody who doesn't follow Jesus. Our life should be marked by putting others first. And as we expect difficulty, checking our motives, why don't we do what we do? Expecting difficulty and putting others first, it leads us to the fourth thing, and we, that's that we imitate Jesus. In order to prevent the spiritual obsessive compulsiveness, imitate Jesus. He's both our example and our motivation. That's why he says in verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's not focused on keeping his position and getting more. In fact, he left his throne in order to serve us. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 in that great hymn, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but was willing to empty himself of all of that, becoming one of us, a servant, to die on the cross for us. He modeled what we're to do. I must admit, I, I admire the disciples' boldness. I mean, at least they didn't ask if they could be a doorkeeper. I mean, they weren't asking for just any task. They wanted the best task that was there. And see, for too long, we have settled for mediocrity in the church. For too long, we've been content just to sit back and let things happen. And so you see their eagerness to be involved in what God was going to do. But they wanted the positions of power. That's where the problem comes in. And after being corrected by Jesus, we see James and John change. They served. They took the gospel to the nations. John was there at the foot of the cross. We see that while Peter spoke up at Pentecost, John and Peter worked together early on in Acts before going separate ways. And history tells us that James and John were marked by humility. And they imitated Jesus. When Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate, you know, had the chance to acquit Jesus. He could have ended it all. He called for a bucket, though, to appease the crowd. He washed his hands in front of the crowd. And he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. We know Jesus the night before had taken a bucket. He called that bucket he proceeded to wash the dirty and dusty feet of his disciples. So today I ask you, which bucket will you use? See, the spirit of Pilate is alive and well today. He knew what he should have done, but he took the easy way out. And he passed on to others the responsibility that was his own. And today, many times we find within the church that we wash our hands of everything we can. We like keeping Pilate's bucket there just to keep our hands clean of any responsibility, any serving, any leadership, anything that we need. Which bucket will you pick up? Jesus told us to take the one of service. He modeled that for us. And we are to imitate him. This morning, would you consider whether you have quit serving because things always have to be right. Or you've quit serving because there was some frustration in there. You quit serving because no one noticed you didn't get the applause. And would we just simply imitate Jesus? Several years ago, there was a faithful old deacon at a church who always prayed the same public prayer that included the phrase, O oh Lord, Touch the community and the unsaved with your finger. Touch the community, touch the unsaved with your finger. One night, after leading in prayer like he often did, he repeated that old phrase, Oh Lord, 
touch the community, touch the lost with your finger. And suddenly he stopped in his prayer. It was an awkward moment. Someone eventually prayed and finished the time together. Afterwards, one of the other people attending the service had stopped this older man, afraid that he was ill, that something had happened to him. Are you okay? Do I need to help you get home? Do, I, do you need some help? What's, what's the matter with you? And the old deacon replied, I'm not ill. But when I prayed that, something seemed to say to me, you are my finger. Church, we are the finger, we're the hand, we're the feet of Jesus. And the only way we show that is through serving. Will you take up the right bucket, putting our wishes, our wants, our desires, anything else aside, and let us be people marked by service. And let's imitate Jesus. Would you bow with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to search your heart today. Maybe today the reason you're not serving is because you've never had your life changed by the power of the gospel. You don't know what the Lord did for you. You've never experienced his forgiveness. And today is the day where you can admit to God that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins so that you can receive that forgiveness and salvation. And you need today to admit, make him the ruler of your life. Admit that you've been in control and confess him as the boss. I'd love to share with you, Father, how you can make that decision. Maybe, Christian, you're here and you haven't served because you need a place in which to serve and God's calling you to make this church your home. Maybe there's some other reason, church member, why you're not serving and it boils down to there's something you couldn't control. Would you repent of that today? Father, help us to imitate you. As we bow in your presence, Lord, you have challenged us through your word. We know that we have to drink your cup and be baptized with your baptism, for Lord, it is a hard road to follow you. But Lord, help us to be faithful with the decisions we make during this time impact our lives and change us as we depart from here. Be honored through our response to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? And as we sing, if you have a public decision to make, would you come quickly this morning? Most importantly, let us be obedient to the call of God upon our lives. Let's turn our eyes upon him. Oh, soul, are you with? At this time, our service is a time for those in attendance to make public decisions as a response to hearing God's word and the Holy Spirit's leading in their life. Maybe the Lord has spoken to you today and there's a decision that you need to make or some questions that you need to answer or just some guidance that you need for some things you're facing in life. I'd like to invite you to call 888-JESUS-20 where you will be linked up with a counselor who can give you direction regarding the decisions that you need to make. You're also welcome to call us here at the church office on Monday morning, 746-2471. But I encourage you not to delay, not to wait until that time, but to right now take the time to make the decisions in your life for which God is leading you to make. Again, that number is 888-JESUS-20.
Father, we do truly turn our eyes upon you. We look in your face today. We see all that we need. Father, we pray you use us, that we'll all have that servant's heart like you modeled for us as we seek to serve you here in this community and around the world. Father, once again, we ask your blessings on these offerings given to you from the gifts that you've already given us and that already belong to you, that you will continue to use them to strengthen this ministry and for others to come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> sing this chorus together. Jesus you've been blessed and challenged by being here today as we depart uh, you will notice that our some of our ushers will be at the door it is our fifth Sunday uh, it happens four times a year and during that we uh, take up an offering for our benevolent fund for the needs that exist in our community uh, many of those are just made known to us individuals that come in others through other ways uh, but if you can give toward that today we greatly appreciate it also you uh, it's kind of the last week we have uh, sorry students your last week with no school at all and uh, we're parents are happy about that we're ready for routine and and uh, I, as, as pastor I'm ready for that I'm ready for us as a church to get back in our routine and got some great things happening as we begin the fall and you'll see many of those in your bulletin I just want to ask you to to be in prayer for those opportunities to get plugged in as you have the opportunity to do so next Sunday is our quarterly I love Yazoo day and uh, Sunday school classes are going to be serving to various capacities. Encouraged to wear your blue I Love Yazoo shirt if you uh, need one. I know some of you got some pain on that, Vernon, uh, the last time. And uh, you might need another one. To me, it just shows you actually did something, Vernon. Uh, but uh, <laughs> not to point Vernon out or anything. But um, if you need one, we do have some extras in the office you can get. Uh, but you know, those classes have various ways. We're going to worship together, then we're going to eat lunch together, and then we'll begin to serve in our community. Our families that are involved in Family University are going to serve together, and so be in prayer for that starting Friday night and Saturday. Uh, we've got over 25 families uh, committed to be involved. Looking forward to a great time with that, encouraging time, but also a challenging time together. So I ask you to be in prayer for that. Also, as you leave, be sure you pick up the list of men eligible for our deacon election. And next Sunday, uh, we will uh, have that time. You'll we'll have the opportunity to vote on seven men uh, that will serve a three-year term. 
And so if you would pick that up, if your name is on there and you wish not to be considered, uh, if you would let us know. And so uh, as you pray about that list, know that a name or two could uh, be removed. I know a couple have been removed. We just didn't reprint those. But uh, make that a matter of prayer this week, that it wouldn't be something we just come in and do real quick, but it would be something that would be... Uh, We'd already have our mind made up as the Lord has directed us and led. It's always amazing for me to be able to see how that happens, uh, that how uh, those that are elected stand out uh, numerically among the votes, so to speak. Uh, it's not a popularity contest. Uh, I hate to use that phrase, election, but we don't know what else to call it. So, uh, But please make that a matter of prayer, and we'll look forward to that next week. So a lot coming up. We look forward to seeing what the, what the Lord is going to continue to do. Let us remain a people that He can use and that God will bless others through. Let's stand together as we are dismissed. Let this be our prayer, our, that family prayer song. Thanks for being here this morning.